So we are going to start now to stay halfway in time. And uh, today is the last day of the third global work of work computation modeling. In the morning, we have three presentations by international speakers, I can say, from various countries, even continents. And uh, they speak about different topics, so you can see again how computation modeling comes together. Uh, from various disciplines. And in the afternoon we have the hackathon, so think about the projects you want to do. In the evening I believe we have a, a cop jam. I'm not sure what the plans for that are. Okay, so there have been plans. The cop jam is as a John, Diego, Pino. Excellent. Yeah, so, so that starts at 7 in Rumpus Cozy by yes. Darius Cross. Is it easy to find? Can yeah. You? Yeah, so the, the, the cocktail for those who don't know is uh, an event that the students organize. Uh, so they will, be, they will sing and probably also do karaoke or whatever. <laughs> so and uh, yeah, it's, we have done it several times and it's always very fun. That's the day, and then the workshop is over, and you can go back to your normal work. Yeah, so it's a pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Nicolas Simeon, and uh, he works for Alibaba Computing uh, Robotics. It's not on this slide, but I'll show it in another one. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he has a background in computer science. Obviously, he started in Germany and got the doctoral degree from the Peterborough University, where he worked in the computer systems and robotics labs. And uh, after that, or during his PhD time, he also was a uh, researcher for relatively brief time here in Plymouth. So there was always a connection. And Aldebaran, the company he works for now, is uh, one of the industry partners of Cognovo. Uh, and, uh, we agreed that should we get an introduction today about what is going on at Adiburan. I, I should say they built one of the most successful robots. Uh, we had one yesterday, the small now robots, uh, and uh, they really are used uh, for many purposes, many people now, and I, I guess that's going to be an interesting talk then. Thanks for coming. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, it's pleasure to be here. So as uh, I said, um, I have just started in Alibaba in um, February this, this year, and before that I was uh, in Finland for a while, so it's really nice to come back. Uh, and so, if I get it right, the uh, PhD students are kind of very interested in this, this group, aren't they? So, just to get a quick overview, maybe, how um, many are computer scientists? So, just a few, and um, okay, so how many are going to use computational modeling in their work? Are you know yet? Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to um, I'm trying to keep this talk rather not so technical, so to more give like the motivation of our work. Um, okay, and uh, I will say first a few words about the company and the robots. This will be rather brief, and then um, I'm going to introduce the A Labs, which are the research facilities in Alabama, and uh, then I'm going to speak about our research. So we're a small team. Um, doing fundamental research, um, and I'm going to say a bit about um, our approach to development robotics. But uh, who's familiar with development robotics, the concept? So few, okay. All right, so, uh, just a few facts about the company. Um, Aldebaran um, is, has by now four offices worldwide, so the headquarters, is in Paris, um, and we have also have um, offices in, in Boston, uh, in Shanghai, and in Tokyo. And I don't know the exact number, but I think uh, we have something like 350 employees now. Um, the main robot, which existed since 2007, is the NOW, which you've seen yesterday, I think. Um, and they've been sold to more than 5,000 units now, um, mostly to universities, high schools for education and, and research. And um, yeah, so they are in 70 countries now. Um, and the vision of the company is to uh, basically make interactive robots, which are uh, for the well-being of humans. And uh, they should be true daily companions for the whole fun family, and 
help people with disabilities. Um, and so it's, these are the three robots actually that have been developed by uh, Ile Baron uh, until now. So the, the small one you saw, uh, saw uh, so yesterday, it's now. And that's really the, the robot which is used in many universities now. Uh, so he's for education and research. And uh, the big one, the taller one, um, is Romeo. And that's actually the, the research platform at Ile Baron where um, we're trying out different uh, mechatronical designs and trying out new things um, for, for example, motors which you cannot get um, just off the shelf and so on. And so Romeo, the, the vision for Romeo is really to have a robot that can actually help uh, in care homes for the elderly and so on. Um, and the most recent robot that was developed is Pepper. Uh, Pepper was just um, unveiled in, in uh, May this year. And actually Pepper was developed um, for a company in Japan, for a company called SoftBank, which is a uh, telecommunications giant in Japan. And uh, we developed Pepper for this company. Um, and they are planning to uh, well, sell it to consumers uh, starting February next year in uh, Japan. It's going to be fairly cheap, but uh, well, so um, SoftBank envisions the robot to be as kind of an emotional companion which you want to take at home and which you want to interact with. But today I'm going to mostly speak about the research which we do at uh, Ida Baron. And um, I'm not going to say a few words about the structure um, of the research units in Ida Baron. Um, so we have well, four labs. Um, there are, we have two advanced mechatronics labs. One uh, is based in Paris and one is based in Nantes. And uh, we have the Romeo facility, also in Paris, and the AI lab. Um, I'm part of the AI lab, which is also in Paris. And the advanced mechatronics teams, um, so the ones in Paris, they are working on new motor designs, trying out new, um, new set of the art ideas. Um, the advanced mechatronics lab in Nantes, they're working on a new hand design. I don't know if Paul said anything about the hand yesterday, grasping capabilities, but now, so that he just has a single degree of freedom, which is not very, well, let's say, uh, grasping is challenging. Um, and so, and now they're working on uh, new designs for more um, more dexterous hands. Um, well, the Romeo lab is working on Romeo, obviously. Um, and uh, we are doing fundamental research. So we are working on uh, artificial intelligence, as the name suggests. And uh, our goal is, well, we are working on developmental robotics, uh, robotics um, motivation. And I'm going to now well, say a bit about our our research goal and uh, how we envision um, to get there. <coughs> this is our team. We are still fairly small. Um, we're just uh, five people here. So Michael, myself, Ivan, Florent, who's a, an intern, and Jean Christophe, who's the director of the lab. Um, in this constellation, which just started in, uh, in April this year, so I think when some of you started the PhDs, we started our lab. Um, so most of the things that we are talk about, we're talking today about would be more motivations of our research because it's all still you know, work in progress. <coughs> so where do we want to go? Um, the goal for our research is, or similar to the company's goals, is to create truly interactive robots. Um, these are marketing photos, obviously. So you know, you, you, they want um, the robots to be. They want them to understand what you say. They want uh, them, or we want them to really understand your uh, the emotions of the people, um, so they can really truly interact normally, naturally with the robots. Um, are we there yet? Well, uh, let's go this way. Uh, you all probably know Siri, the personal assistant that. Uh, is in, in the iPhone since a couple of years. And you can speak to Siri using your language, using your, your voice, and um, ask questions and uh, Siri will find answers. So for example, you can say, is there a restaurant nearby? And we'll find a restaurant for you. Uh, you can ask what the weather will be like tomorrow. And we'll find a, re a weather report. Um, but all of these 
things that Siri can do has, have been carefully designed by an engineer. So there's um, this pretty pretty company, Apple, has invested lots of minimal money to program these things into it. And um, so does Siri really understand what we do, or we not? And um, so this approach, which uh, I call engineering intelligence, uh, basically works like this. So um, the engineer thinks of a, a use case, a task that the system should solve, and then um, makes an abstract description of this task and how it could be solved, creates um, algorithms, thinks of data structures. And uh, so here you can see two examples. On the left hand, it's uh, speech understanding. And on the right hand side, it's um, visual scene. Uh, recognition, and for the left hand, uh, you will the, the engineer would think about maybe some kind of grammatical structure, and this real uh, tree-like um, data structure, and um, then the task would be to find a way to basically map the the speech input. So you see the waveform to, um, to match that with with some kind of uh, uh, symbolical structure of a sentence, like I fulfill a function. Um, and on the right hand side, it's fairly similar, you have a high level representation of an abstract data structure and uh, you think of algorithms that work on these data structures and then you need to find a way to connect them back to the images. And if you think about the way that intelligent robots work, it's exactly the same thing. So um, almost all robots that you could call fairly intelligent today work this way. You have a kind of layered cognitive architecture we call. And uh, in this layer of cognitive architecture, you have on the highest level a delib deliberation layer, then come sort of several inter intermediate, uh, intermediate layers, and at the bottom you have uh, sensory processing and action generation, so the, uh, the process that actually um, interact with the world. And so the engineer would put, basically would imagine all the use cases of the robot, all the tasks the robot should solve, uh, find algorithms to solve them, find data structures, put them in the highest levels, and then um, connect them back to lower layers where well, object, object detection, object justification, and so on um, are implemented, and also controlling the actions. Um, this on the left hand side is obviously a very simplified view, and um, what you find in papers, research papers, um, looks more like these box, the, the box diagrams, box diagrams on the right hand side with lots of boxes and arrows. This is still a very beautiful, quite simple um, uh, representation, which somebody, so the researchers here have you know, prepared to show how simple their system is. So if they were honest, uh, if they were honest, they would put loads and loads of more uh, boxes still there. Now, um, so here just a very simple example. Uh, imagine this robot has the high level task, they should take a bath. And uh, the engineer has told him, okay, so you need a rubber duck. Uh, so this is a high level representation of what it knows, how it, how it works to take a bath. And to actually fulfill the task, it needs to find a duck using feature detection, so very uh, computer vision algorithms, um, classifying the duck. And then once it sees the duck, it can plan and go ahead and take a duck and go take a bath. So <clears throat> you could ask, um, well, we have we've done AI research since the, since the second, uh, 60s already. So loads of really clever people have worked on this problem. And um, you could think, well, they're doing this for a certain uh, reason. They're doing this this way because maybe it's the best way to do it. But um, it helps to look at basically the history of uh, the field of AI to see if it's really the case. So in the 60s, um, this is a, ro a robot called um, Shaky. Shaky is usually um, referred to as the first uh, autonomously uh, acting intelligent robot, if you want. Um, it was at Stanford University. And um, what we see afterwards, what happened is basically people, the researchers noticed it's incredibly difficult to engineer intelligence. And uh, we have no idea how to do it. And, so what they did is they started to tackle smaller sub-problems. And so research fields such as computer vision, speech processing, locomotion control, and so on, all uh, 
well, developed out of the initial AI field and became that their own individual research fields. And now they are all huge research um, fields with, uh, where, where researchers have developed um, very, well, uh, very specialized um, data structures and algorithms to solve exactly these, pro these problems, these sub-problems. And now we see since well, a decade or so, um, it's basically research tries to gather everything back together and to do systems integration to create actually intelligent robots. Um, and it's very hard to do that. And therefore, well, most of you I think are probably in you know, Plymouth, in Plymouth they have a sort of a concentration of researchers and development and robotics. So I guess most of you are familiar with this argument. Um, uh, there is a new development since about um, well, a decade that uh, basically tries to not model the end result but the process. And this is uh, taking inspiration from uh, developmental psychology. This is, for example, a, a um, quote by Gene Mandler, who's a, a developmental psychologist at um, UCSD in, um, in California. And she says that, well, we have gradually come, so she's speaking about psychology. We have gradually come to the realization that one of the best ways to understand the complexity of mental processes is to find their origins in infancy and trace them as they develop over time. And well, um, develop, development of robotics basically tries the same thing. Um, so we are not trying to create the intelligent system by putting all the specialized algorithms that have, that have been developed, putting them back into the system, but trying to find the processes before we get there. And uh, this is an analogy um, that John Gustav thought about. I think it's very helpful. Um, so you could imagine the, the intelligent system, the, the cognitive system, as a kind of um, crystal that um, looks extremely complex and uh, absolutely astonishing. And so you could think about, how can I create such a thing? And then you could go ahead and maybe carve it out of, out of rock, or you could create a, a 3D printer and start making a scan and printing it um, and try to see if you can get there. But it's extremely difficult to create it. But if you know the, the underlying processes, how, how this crystal self-organizes, then you can just have like create the initial conditions and it will grow itself. And that's what we are trying to do. Also, we are, so we are following this research paradigm of development robotics in the AI lab. But still, um, it's difficult to think of well, a way to get started. And, Think of where you want to go. Well, I want to do cognitive systems, a challenging thing. So you need some kind of uh, research program to get that. And uh, so what we are trying to do is basically, well, so it's, it's going to be some form of a developmental timeline of a robot. And um, there are four landmarks. And on the left, the earliest ones are low-level unsupervised learning. Then they come sensory motor conceptualization, learning to interact, so socially interact, um, and then on the right hand you see grounded language games. Now in the remainder of the talk I want to uh, explain to you and try to convince you that um, well, it's a good, uh, a good uh, direction that we, we are taking. So we are, we can, uh, this might lead us somewhere, somewhere interesting at least. And um, I'm going to explain this backwards, really. And I will start with grounded language games. So, language games mm, are a concept which, who's familiar with language games? Just, uh, just uh, some maybe a bit. So, language games um, are a computational, um, computational model to study questions such as how does a culture agree on a vocabulary? Or how can a new member of a culture learn the vocabulary? And they have been studied a lot by Luke Stiegel, you can see here, two of his robots. Um, he's a researcher for, uh, at Sony um, Computer Science Laboratory in Paris. And he's been working on language games for more, more than a decade now. And the, the core idea behind language games is really simple, it's fairly simple. So um, Luke calls them um, a routinized situ uh, situated interaction between two embodied agents who have cooperative goals. And a language game goes something like this. So you could imagine these two robots playing a language game. So you would sit them at the table, 
put a few ob objects on the table, and then you declare one of the robots, the robots to be uh, the speaker, and the other robot will be the listener. And then what they do is the speaker um, basically just randomly selects one of the objects that it sees and looks, thinks um, if it knows already a word to name this object. And if it knows an, uh, a word, it just says it. If it doesn't know a word, it thinks of a new one. Um, then the listener tries to guess which of the objects the, the speaker was talking about. And um, so he also has a, basically a memory of uh, associations between words and objects. And so he will make a good guess which of the objects it was. And the speaker basically just gives feedback. So we, the, the listener will point at the object, and the, list, the speaker will say yes or no. And um, if the speaker is saying yes, so the, uh, the Luke would say the conversation was successful, then um, the listener will update its memory of this association between the word and the, the object. And if it was not successful, it will decrease the, the association, weaken the association. And so what you see um, when you, so you just don't just do it once a single time, but you basically do it a thousand times. And um, you do it with a population of agents. So um, really, it's not just two robots that are playing with each other, but it's um, thousands of virtual agents. And each of these agents can download into the robot. And then they will play against each other or with each other this language game. And so it's, re it's repeated and repeated thousands of times. And what you see is that basically in the very beginning, um, the, of the culture of robots um, has many words for, for all these objects. So very, very, very many different words. But after thousands of uh, iterations of the process, um, they will converge to, to a shared vocabulary. So it's a self-organized way of finding a vocabulary for the objects that are existing in the, the, in the environment of the culture. So it's an um, abstract way of thinking about the way that well, culture, some, which is somewhere localized on the planet, develops its own language. And it's also a way to ask the question, how is the Gavagai problem solved? So the Gavagai problem is, um, you can imagine the following situation. You have a um, field linguist who goes into the Amazon, Amazonian rainforest to study the language of a tribe. And so he, one day he, he wants to create a dictionary, basically. So writing down all the words that the tribesmen are using and um, translate them into English. And so one day, He's following one of the tribesmen on a hunt, and they see a rabbit. And then the, the tribesman says, Gavagai. So what does it mean? It could either, either mean rabbit, or it could also mean um, carrot. So maybe the, the, um, the rabbit was eating a carrot. Or it could also mean uh, we're having rabbit for dinner. So you don't know. Um, so how can this be solved, this problem? And then you can ask this question using language games. And um, you can imagine it this way. So you have two robots that are playing a language game, and they see um, objects of different colors. It's not just two, or two colors that we see, or three, or just a handful, but it's a continuous space of colors that they can see. And so um, there's a red robot on the right hand side. He might have seen lots of um, yellow balls, and I've spoken to many other robots that only know the concept of yellow. So he might have developed the kind of Representation saying this this part of the color space is yellow, um, but the blue one is fairly new in the culture. He doesn't know the concept so well yet, and so he might think yellow is this kind of area. And in this situation, so they both see yellow, which is here, so this particular shade of yellow, and uh, they will agree that it's yellow. But um, if it actually was a ball that had this color, um, the blue one might might say yellow, and the, the red one wouldn't agree. Um, but when you, what you observe when you do these, these kinds of experiments is that um, basically also these, these, um, these segmentations of the conceptual spaces, they also converge to uh, shared conceptual space or segmentation among the uh, members of the culture. So these are really very interesting results that you uh, can generate using language games in a very seemingly natural way. Um, 
So if you ask, are um, language games a good abstraction, a good way to study actual problems? Uh, so uh, do language games exist in, in the real world? Well, you, you, ask, you have to say that with an idealized description of what happens in the real world. And um, there are many problems that uh, so you make many assumptions about the, the process that are going on. So for example, there are no universal interaction protocols probably um, for language games. You couldn't program a single language game into a robot and then it would start to use them with us because we probably use uh, much more you know, messy interactions Messy interaction dynamics, and we don't have, uh, for example, clear cut um, segmentations between our interactions. So, in the, the language games, you just turn on the robots and they know now it's starting, we do a language game, and it's finished. So, this is all much more messy, and um, I think we would like to get something like that in a developmental way. And we think that a plausible reformulation of language games is basically to say, um, well, the robots try to predict the behavior of the others. So, um, you can imagine the robot um, saying a word, saying a label for an object, and so it imagines the other person to react in a certain way. So maybe to get the object, to drop the point on the object. Um, so, what you see, what, what you would see is that um, if a language game is successful, the behavior of the other would be predictable, and it wouldn't uh, and, and otherwise, because uh, in the other, other robot, if you didn't knew the, the label, you would have to guess what the other one was talking about. So, basically, we think that it would be absolutely amazing result to have, have robots that can really create, um, to develop something like language games in a natural way. So we would like to get there. And now, well, there's all these assumptions which are being made about uh, the robots in language games. So we, they know how to interact, for example. And um, so we need a way to develop basically the ability to learn, uh, to, to interact socially. And so here's two examples that I want to give um, of how we think this could be um, tackled. So you imagine this little fellow. Um, he desperately wants some of the toys but he cannot reach them. And uh, so what can he do? So in the beginning, when he's still younger, he would probably you know, just cry and uh, his parents will come and uh, try to find out what's wrong with him and, and at some point he will, will get what he wants. Um, but so he, he sort of notices when I do something and it's nice people, my parents will come and help me. Um, but it can be better and he can do better if he actually learns to develop different words. So if you can manage to say elephant, if you really want the elephant, um, you will get to what he wants more efficiently. Um, so basically what, he's, what, uh, what infants are learning are that they can really control other people by, by doing certain things, We're doing very specific kind of actions. Um, they won't just sort of manipulate the physical world, but they will also be able to manipulate the social world. And a second example, which is one of the earliest sort of conventions that parents and infants come to, is basically sort of infant, infants do this when they want to be picked up. So most infants uh, develop this kind of um, kind of actions. And basically, a very early word, if you want to, a very early communicative signal. And yeah, that's one of the, uh, the first things where, where infants basically learn. If I do this, I can control. You know, uh, we sense um, my parents. Uh, so we think of um, social interaction, at least like a cultural interaction, if you want, um, as basically a special case of um, doing sensory motor interaction with the world. Basically, by trying to manipulate, trying to control uh, the social environment. So to get there, we first need to solve that. And here, um, this is more of a core of what we're doing. Um, so to create sensory motor representations, so you could think of um, a robot like this. So uh, as I said earlier, the, the approach to engineering intelligence, what the engineer will do is 
he will create um, feature detectors, uh, classification um, systems, and so on, uh, to abstract away from the hugely complex visual input. Which just take the camera input and treating that is very difficult and um, seems untractable if you want to just intel uh, engineer intelligence. And so they will create an abstraction layer. And um, so the, system, the robot, when it looks at a scene, doesn't see a tree, but it basically just sees a vector of, um, of activations like this. Um, and another maybe an edge detection um, layer which would generate another um, vector of activations. So does, how, how can the robot make sense of this? And can it at all? And I think a good way to imagine the situation the robot is in is, so you could imagine you're a staff lead uh, cadet. You've joined um, the crew of the Enterprise, and now you're on a mission. You've flown to a um, faraway planet, and your mission is to beam a robot on the surface of the planet and to you know, explore the planet. And the only interface that you have is this. So you just have this console. The robot is doing stuff on the on the planet, and you just see the lights blinking and turning on, turning off, and so on. And so you're a scientist, so you will start making notes. And you might see that, yeah, this green lamp often is um, lit at the same time as the yellow lamp, so it must be something. And you go on and, and create the statistics. Um, but it would be really difficult to learn anything about the planet. But um, the actual way how you can really learn to do stuff is by you know, pressing buttons and see what happens. So if you press the button and then the, the big, big uh, red button um, is lit. Um, and this might sound a bit uh, philosophical, but well, we, this is really an approach which has been proposed by uh, Kevin Oregon and Noe in uh, 2001, which they call uh, the sensing motor contingency theory. And they basically argue, basically argue that um, being able to uh, use your motors, so you use your actions, is fundamentally coupled with the ability to actually recognize stuff to recognize visual input and generate um, sensory input. So there's no, no such thing, according to the argument, uh, as pure, pure sensory um, processing. And an example that they give is the example of feeling the softness of a sponge. So if you imagine you have a sponge in your hand between your fingers. Um, if you just hold it like that, you won't be able to really say, say if it's soft or not so soft. But the only way to really do that is by, by squeezing your fingers and trying it out. And then you'll get a feeling of how soft the sponge is. Now, it might sound fairly abstract, but um, there is uh, evidence that it's really that way. And for me, the most um, helpful example is um, one about uh, studies on sensory sub substitution. So this, these are experiments that were done by uh, Bach and Rita um, in the 70s. And the, the experiment, what they did is basically they uh, invited people that were born blind and asked them to sit on the chair, which is here depicted on the right. And in the chair, there's, um, in, the, in the back of the chair, there's a device, a tactile uh, device, which basically transforms the input from a camera, a TV camera, into sort of uh, moving needles, or needles, those things that are pushing a bit into your back when you sit on the chair. And so you, the, the researchers thought, okay, so you show them simple patterns, and we try to let them recognize the patterns, basically by, they should see what they would feel, what, what, what's uh, happening in the backs. And so they did this, invited lots of participants, and none of them were able to do it. None of them were able to learn the, the patterns the researchers showed them. So it was a bit frustrating, but at some point there was one of the, uh, the, the participants who just asked, so can I, can I move the camera a bit, please? I would just like to try it out. And then he took the camera and started to move a bit. And immediately he sort of felt and it makes sense. You know? And then he started to move it around. And after like four hours or so, he could tell concepts such as shadows, perspectives, and so on. So really things that he could not have known from other, other modalities. So what you see here is basically that you need to be able to explore to really make sense of what you see. Otherwise, it's just no inputs. They are just vectors of, of um, activations. That make any sense. And um, the researchers are now doing sort of the same experiments um, with 
device that you put on your on the tongue of um, participants? Yes. I'm not sure I get the point because you don't use your television and still understand what sound is good. Well, you, you have learned to see what you see in television because you are able to explore the environment. You only, you only relate to the learning process. Sorry? You only want to speak about the learning process. Yeah, so the, the, exactly. To be able to learn about um, the signals, so you need to somehow connect them to your ability to manipulate them. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, if we go back to answer that question a bit more, maybe. Um, so you could, you could learn statistics about um, the kind, you know, the way that the, the, the lights light up and how they light up together and so on. So you could um, learn something, but it seems to be too complex to do it, too, too difficult to do it um, up to a point where you can actually use them without um, connecting this information very early on to your goal. Because, um, well, if you uh, think about the literature on uh, reported learning, it's just exploding. So um, if you add dimensions to your tasks, um, it's just extremely difficult to handle the complexity of the problem of solving a um, successful task. If you just... Um, um, that's not really a good example I'm giving here. Do you think it's all misled? Sorry? Do you think it's all misled by the wrong type of research? Which one? Which are you? Reinforcement learning. No, reinforcement learning, well... Um, no, that was a really bad example. I'm sort of uh, putting myself in the back corner here. Um, obviously, the reinforcement learning is all about to, uh, actively exploring. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you try to create an abstraction layer on top of just the, the sensory representation, you will end up having a, a, a simplified um, version of the, of the input, which might not be helpful, might not be informative. And, um, so, basically, we are, we are thinking that um, um, this argument makes a lot of sense, that you can really, you, you start to look at at least every, everything, so from the very top, very bottom of, um, of representations, so simple stuff like uh, feeding the softness of the of sponge, up to fairly, fairly high level representations, basically in the same way, that you just can um, do this, uh, you know how to manipulate stuff. So to contrast that again, um, so you're on the left hand side, the approach of the, uh, the typical approach of an engineer would be to develop a high level representation first by an, uh, abstractly um, analyzing the problems and then um, well, finding a way to, to ground these, these uh, representations in the inputs. Um, and as opposed to that, we think that um, actually, we should try to most model something like um, what you see on the right-hand side of the sensory motor network, um, where you really um, have so each, of, each of these nodes is basically a sensory um, state, if you want. So what uh, what the robot sees, maybe maybe uh, uh, the state of the visual system, um, and the robot learns to um, to have the to to know to much to to predict. Um, how it can change this input using its own actions. And um, so a very simple example would be uh, visual exploration of the world. Um, so for example, this particular well, say sensory motor network could correspond to um, the situation where a robot looks at the solar can and learns to saccade across the object and to learn to predict how it can um, change the input of its real visual camera um, by using its motors. And so as long as the robot is, is looking at uh, the solar can, it can very pre well, predict uh, fairly easily or very reliably um, how the, the input will change as it escapes in a certain pattern. So this, um, in contrast to using you know, feature layers and classifiers to recognize uh, an object, this is really a sort of an active probing of the world to, to try to recognize an object. And um, so you don't have just a single 
uh, representation of one object, but uh, you could have several of these uh, these um, sensory motor graphs. And then what could happen is um, that you might see something which is very ambiguous. Uh, so you might might be in a in a you might see something which could be a sort of hand, but it could also be something else. And then you can start to make predictions and make, uh, basically come up with a strategy of resolving the, uh, the ambiguity. So basically, you could say, I think I'm on solar cannon, so I'll make this movement, and then I'll end up here, if I'm, my prediction is correct, and now I'm on a solar so I'm looking at a solar cannon. And otherwise, uh, if you end up somewhere else, which you don't know, then you want to explore further to see what, what you're looking at. More questions about this, or otherwise, I'll, okay, I'll continue. So um, to get there, still doing this on um, raw camera input or raw sensory input uh, is fairly untractable. And um, so, still also to get there, you need to do some kind of um, simplification of the sensory input. And uh, so this is where we think yeah, those low-level unsupervised learning comes into play. And um, here, a still very popular um, topic is deep learning, which um, well, many companies now do. Um, so it's been proposed, many people uh, fight about uh, who was the first to, to really propose the idea, but basically um, it's often connected to uh, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, who wrote a paper in science in 2006. And so just deep learning is really a simple idea of um, having basically just a multi-layer system and you pre-train each of these layers um, just using, since, uh, using uh, data. So you just crunch a lot of data and um, pre-train each layer independently and then you stock up and after a while you have a fairly robust um, uh, uh, unsupervised learning mechanism which creates abstractions of the inputs. So companies like Google, uh, Microsoft, they were doing it to, uh, you know, um, basically compress data. Um, so Google is doing it on, on images from the internet and so on. Um, and currently, it's really the, the best way of, of that we know of, um, of creating um, uh, dimension energy re uh, reduction. So lower level representations of uh, the noisy raw input. Um, and so, well, we also want to do something like that, but um, for us it's more you know, not so much about just crunching those data. We don't have a um, Google computing cluster, so we can't do that. Um, but we, so this is a paper which uh, Mikael um, wrote for the ICDR next month, so we'll um, present that on a poster there. Um, just giving a short overview. Um, well, when you have a body, you're a robot, you don't just take passively all the data in and um, start to train your some deep learning architecture. But what you can do is you can actively explore. So you can move around and change what you see. And um, so we tried to, or Mikael tried to um, basically um, find a system which actively selects where it looks so that it can learn better uh, the representation in such a um, layered architecture. And um, the way that he did it is that so the robot saccades to points in the visual field where it currently improved the most its representation. So you can compute this, this, um, um, this measure of how well you improve on a certain point in the, in the visual field using a measure called well, um, information theoretical measure entropy. And um, he computed that on each time, um, on each duration to, to find the places in the visual input where um, where the robot improved the most. And then he sucked it there and continued to learn using that uh, input as, um, as training samples. And what you what he found was that um, he achieved actually really better results. Um, so he would converge to uh, better um, <coughs> better results. So this is um, again using an, an a measure the same measure entropy. So basically the um, the distinctiveness of, of the abstract codes that, um, uh, so the abstraction codes that uh, develop in the system, um, they are fairly, fairly different, which is a good thing because 
can more easily um, distinguish between uh, inputs. And um, comparing that to just simply randomly selecting uh, where you look and learning there, um, you end up with a better visual code. Okay. So this uh, sums up my, my talk. Um, basically, I try to give an, an overview of the research direction we are trying to go. Um, so we are trying to get to something which is similar to language games, but in a, in a natural way, in a developmental way. We want to, we don't want to um, have robots that develop their own language. We would like to have robots that um, basically can naturally interact with us and learn our, our words. So this could be like a proto-interaction, but still I think this would be absolutely amazing to get results like that. So we would like to get there, and what we see as necessary steps to, to get to that um, goal is to first, well, we need to learn to interact socially, and this we think is um, basically learning that you can not only control the physical objects in the world, but also your social environment, so other people. You can well, control it, that's a strong sense, but um, you can try to make them do stuff for you, or respond in a certain um, predictable way. And, um, well, so we say that um, social action is pretty much a approach interaction, it's pretty much a uh, special case of physical sensor motor interaction. And I proposed this, uh, this view based on the sensor motor contingency theory that we are following. And, uh, well, also low level unsupervised learning still plays into it. Okay. So, I quickly want to make an announcement before I finish, which is um, about a website that we are building. Um, so the field of development in robotics is obviously very strongly linked to development psychology. And we, um, well, we take lots of inspiration from research and development psychology. But uh, the literature on development psychology is just so vast and there's so many publications that it's often, often difficult to you know, get an overview of a new topic which you're not familiar with. And uh, so you can either well, read encyclopedia articles or um, Wikipedia articles, but they're often outdated and they just reflect the biased view, or you could try to find a um, survey article that's the same thing, uh, might be biased, uh, and often they only exist from decades ago. Um, and so what we would, we think is, would be a really helpful tool, not just for development of uh, roboticists, but also for students and researchers in other disciplines. Also in development psychology would be a tool uh, basically a platform, a website, where you have a database of uh, facts backed by research articles, peer-reviewed research articles, about uh, cognitive development, or studies on uh, cognitive development. And so you could um, imagine it so as, a, as a website where you have different tools to visualize the data. And this is just a very simple example. So. Um, we created a very small database of um, articles. Uh, we annotated the data of um, the studies, and um, then what you can do is you can sort of select topics um, from these uh, articles, and then create visualiz visualizations like this. So, for example, here I uh, selected gesturing, pointing, and reaching as topics, just to see sort of at what, what points in time um, researchers study these topics. So when do they do, uh, what, with what age groups they do these studies. And so what you see is, uh, you can fairly, fairly intuitively see that um, people studying these topics think that reaching develops sort of at this point in time. So this, um, I guess, eight to 10 months. Um, then pointing develops over a longer period across the, uh, the second year. And then afterwards reaching develops. And so you can more intuitively explore uh, the corpus data, and if you want more information, just click on one of the articles and, and you can start reading it. Um, so we are organizing a workshop at ICDL next month, um, uh, which is on the topic of pathways of community development. And so we want to get into contact with um, researchers in the field of, um, of uh, development psychology to start to develop this idea and 
So the pathways approach um, to cognitive development is something that Linda Smith proposed. And she basically says what we think is similar to, to this idea. It's basically that you should study um, not just uh, basically doing analysis of, um, of at one point in time of uh, development, but you should really trace the development of individual infants. And uh, that actually what, uh, when you do that, you uh, you, you learn, learn more about um, development. And yeah, so if some of you are at ICDI next month, uh, we hope that you uh, can come to our workshop. And with that. Yeah, thanks for the nice overview. And so uh, there is time for questions. Um, yeah, so a lot of the examples you have shown, for example, uh, for the visual, visual domains, uh -huh. object recognition, object detection, etc., um, have been developed without embodiment in mind. Yeah. So working on 3D static images or um, artificial even samples. Um, do, you, do you see it as an advantage or disadvantage that now you apply these algorithms in a robot? So I would answer that question basically by by taking again the the, the analogy of a crystal mm -hmm. by saying that you know you can get fairly far if you use specialized um, algorithms, representations, and so on. You can create fairly complex systems. I mean, we have. It's the same that's being done in the now and the and, and the other robots. We don't know the uh, no exception. So any fairly complex robot that you see today is based on these approaches. You take off the shelf the vision um, so algorithms that solve stuff in vision tasks and you use them. You apply them and you get. But um, well, you only get so far because uh, it is extremely difficult to create a really complex system. So a really intelligent system. And so we think that yes, we could follow this approach. Taking the, I mean they're tremendously successful in their own domain. Um, you can get recognition rates in certain tasks of uh, up to 99 percent um, But that's always making making many assumptions about the data. And uh, it's not just general input, general vision you're solving, but solving a certain uh, subtask. Um, and yeah, so we think that um, it's a way to get to a certain point, but if you want to really develop something like truly interactive robots, uh, you won't get that point. Yet. It's just too difficult to tackle the complex. I guess just following on from Ivana's question, I mean, do you think our goals are achievable? Because we kind of have compared our companions, we have kind of empathy with, we have the same intrinsic motivations and feelings about stuff which the robot will never have. So you are arguing that... So I'm being a bit provocative here. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually possible to do. <coughs> to, uh, well, I mean, I sort of agree with what Tony said yesterday, that, uh, you know, um, we develop empathies for dogs. Dogs are very empathetic towards, towards us, even though they are very different. You know? They um, probably have fundamentally different sensors and fundamentally, but very different sensors in, in many ways, and also their internal lives, their internal emotional systems. Uh, it's probably very different from ours, but um, we are still able to connect to them. And um, I would say that uh, it's probably similar for robots. So if we can develop robots that are as complex and as intelligent as uh, a certain, well, you know, like, like dogs, it's tremendously complex already. Uh, so if you can get there, I, I don't. I think that's possible. Michael, um, do you think that uh, in principle a cognitive or a conscious uh, system has to be modeled? Um, that's a really interesting question, and um, well, we sort of thought a bit about this. Um, we were wondering if it would be possible to develop you know, the behavior of uh, 
since we mentioned that before, like computer game world. So and, um, there's a visual agent, uh, virtual agent that plays Quake and uh, interacts with humans uh, also playing Quake. So Quake is a first-person shooter game, which is very successful. Um, and so we're wondering, uh, will it be possible to really you know, develop exactly the same behavior as the human player? And um, I would guess that it might probably be similar to um, what you find in um, the way that Google translates when you put a sentence into Google. It will come up with a fairly accurate translation. And they're building up statistical models, you know, about um, how words relate to each other and so on. And uh, you could turn on um, this model and start with a sentence, so maybe the first three words, and you could ask it to continue, come on, write, write a story for me. And it will probably do something fairly, something makes, which makes sense in the first ten words, maybe, but afterwards it will be just rubbish. That doesn't make any sense anymore. So there's no true understanding of what, what's going on. And I think it would probably be similar because, um, well, you as a human player, you know about social interactions. You know about you know, conventions, about how close I can get to Thomas without him being uncomfortable and so on. And uh, all these subtle things, you know, they, um, oh, sorry, wrong. <laughs> Of German, so this is good. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think you know, it would be fairly difficult for, for a virtual agent in, in the world of Quake to learn of these concepts because it just is missing lots of information. If that answers, it's the best. It's, answer yeah, yeah, of course. I'm not expecting this. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, there's the proof that not all cognitive systems need to be embodied because you can think about a system that simulates an environment and a cognitive system that is embodied but is isolated from the rest of the world. And uh, as such, it is not embodied. But still, one would call it a cognitive system. There's a cognitive system inside. Okay, more questions? Yeah, you were talking about language games. Um, basically, language games come from Ludwig van Wittgenstein um, in his Tractatus, so it's not something the roboticists use, okay. but it's something we all do. So basically, meaning is grounded in social interaction, mm -hmm. and we are just right now playing language games. And when I hear the term AI, intelligence, I think that's a prime example for a language game because the attributes we associate with that term might be quite different. So Wittgenstein is talking about the beetle in a box. Everybody has a box and there's a beetle inside it. And I say it's a beetle and you might say it's a beetle. But you might actually mean it's empty by saying beetle and I might say it's chocolate by saying beetle. So we have different associations. Um, so the problem is how to get semantics out of language because my brain is actually not processing just a string of auditory input but it's basically dealing with meaning and I think this is one of the biggest issues for AI, one of the hard problems how do you really get understanding which is a prerequisite for intelligence into a machine so how would you respond to that how can you solve that with playing language games because you have to implement understanding and meaning in order to uh, make an intelligent agent. I absolutely agree. I'm sorry to, to say that uh, Luke Steele's came up came up the uh, the uh, the idea, so mm -hmm. the, the dilemma of uh, AI people. They always say, "Ah, us, we are doing good commission and we solve it." No, but um, so yeah, absolutely agree. I mean, the robot needs to find the, the meaningful things in the world by itself. That's exactly the, the argument that we agree on when we say we do development robotics. Because, um, so the, I mean, if you look at development, um, you first have sensory motor interaction, exploration, autonomous exploration, taking stuff that you that they define, putting in the mouth, and so on and so forth. And then gradually, language plays a more and more important role. And um, so I would say, 
I might be wrong, it's just uh, my, uh, I think that comes to my mind, but I'd say it's, you know, then it's more like the process of tuning um, my meaning to your meaning uh, by doing this, this, well, language games again, as uh, I said in the example of the yellow ball. So we might have different meanings in the beginning, but um, at least we come to a point where our interaction works. Mm. So. But that doesn't mean that actually in the robotic in the robot's mind, so to say, yeah. there is a process of semantics. So basically, cornea are completely missing. So mm. basically, the Chinese room argument formulated by John Searle mm. is still quite a devastating criticism. Or how would you see that? Well, I, I, I mean, think I don't. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I don't feel like your goal necessarily is to create qualia. And it's really kind of, I mean, the way you stated the goals for the company mm -hmm. is to achieve kind of very functional things, I suppose. And, you know, I, which kind of leads to, are you interested in, in creating robotic, artificial experiences? I mean, um, you're absolutely right. We are trying to create a robot that works. That's the main, main point. But um, if, uh, I mean, it's really difficult. Question if um, so you need. Uh, head or the shadow, mm. or and understanding has to do with quality, so to say. So you kind of decouple. Do you know that? That's the question. Do you know that it has to do with quality? <laughs> I mean, uh, can you prove that? The very notion of quality is very debatable. The very notion of quality is very debatable. Do we have something special that's quality? So you would actually ask the question, do we have qualia in the yeah. first place? I can yeah. just now feel the atmosphere, I can see colors, they have a specific emotional content, so there's the qualitative X aspect to the quantitative data so which are those. very intuitive uh, proof of it, which could also be very misleading. And when, you, when you look into the details of it, when you look at the inverted qualia for experiments, you can find a lot of things that are actually wrong. So you question if there are emotions in the first place because no, emotions no, are no, really no, 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 a different thing though. So I don't think we should go into that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's an, a bottomless pit. <laughs> and uh, unless you have a different question. I don't really have time for a different question. No, we don't really have so short and different. <laughs> Oh, um, very deeply, different subject. To talk about the visual design of the robot, we, um, I think what, it's really appealing. And if I were to interact with a robot and it made conscious mistakes, I would forget it again and again. <laughs> and I think this, it, it, engen it engenders a kind of, a, a, if not empathy, a sympathy for the robot. Mm. Um, who came up with the design? How did you know the design? Mm. And why? And, you know, Yesterday, Tony was talking about how his model after anime kind of aesthetics, the big eyes, the big pupils, which we know kind of, you know, the big light features. Yeah, so I'm not, I don't really know, I would say, but um, I mean, there's, there's research on, um, also in um, product design on exactly these topics, you know, to, to connect to the, the basic feelings of, you know, big eyes and what I'm about to say. But um, I think you raised a really interesting point, and um, I would, uh, so just to follow quickly up on this, this uh, I think um, this might actually be something which um, also helps the, the robots to, to achieve more easily um, complex tasks, learning, uh, because you know, they will trigger uh, parental behaviors and so on, if we're building the right way, the right way, and um, yeah, I think uh, it, this is probably, you know, they will, designers want you to feel that way, but it will really help us to achieve what we want to do. Okay. We have to. Yep. So let's say.